But there are two kinds of sequels, those that expand on the ideas of the original game, and those that change the formula. When a sequel changes the formula, it can be very conflicting. If the original formula is well done, it can be very disappointing when it's changed, especially if even more sequels continue with the new formula and leave the old one behind. But there are times when the change ends up being better than the original. The thing to keep in mind is that change isn't inherently good or bad. There are good changes, and there are bad changes, but it's a case-by-case -case basis. Thousand Year Door took what made the original good and expanded on it greatly. It is a prime example of a sequel done right. It's a beloved game that has earned its stellar reputation. I recommend watching my review of it, and the first game, to know what made them so good. But when the time came for a sequel to Thousand Year Door, what we got wasn't like what we had before. Paper Mario had changed with this entry, and it would never be the same again. Super Paper Mario was its name, and to say this game was divisive would be an understatement. Because of how much the Thousand Year Door was loved, and how much Super Paper Mario changed, it was instantly known as the Black Sheep. It was very alienating to those who loved the first two games. A lot of people hated it. But in more recent years, it has been getting a lot more appreciation. There are a few explanations for this. Perhaps people were too harsh at first in their anger by the changes, and upon reflection, it turned out to be a lot better. Maybe the changes were actually good. Or, what's most likely, it no longer seems so bad in comparison to what the future brought, but that's for another video. But even though this game is much more appreciated than at first, it is still rather divisive because of those changes. But what was changed? And were those changes good or bad? That's what I'm here to discuss. So, without further ado, let's get this review started. I talked about how the game had changed a lot, but the quality of the story isn't something that changed. The Thousand Year Door stepped up its story from the first game with a deeper plot and characters, not to mention all new villains. And Super Paper Mario, well, it goes even further than Thousand Year Door, and because of that I'm gonna have to structure this a little differently. Oh, and here's a serious spoiler warning. I'm not kidding when I said it goes farther than Thousand Year Door, and I'm going all in with this story. As soon as we begin, we get the traditional story about something that will be of great importance to the plot. In this case, it's a book called The Dark Prognosticus. It's a prophetic book that held stories of the future. Naturally, many people would want a book like that, but no one ever found happiness within its pages, for its dark secrets were not meant for people's eyes. The next thing we see is Bowser and Peach about to get married, being cheered on by all of Bowser's minions. Oh, well then, you've got my full attention. This wedding is being conducted by this dapper fellow, Count Black, and his assistant, Nastasia. Peach is naturally confused, though Bowser is pretty happy about this. But it wasn't his plan. It seems that Count Black is the one who prepared this wedding on his own. But the ceremony begins. Bowser, ferocious and fearsome, evil king of the Koopas. Do you take Peach to be your lawfully wedded wife till your games be over? I love the wording on that. Instead of, until death do you part, it's till your games be over. But of course, Bowser says yes. Peach, noble princess, pure of heart. Do you take Bowser to be your lawfully wedded husband till your games be over? She obviously refuses, but nothing about this wedding was a choice. Nastasia starts using her super hypnosis on Peach. Peach resists at first, but not for long. <laughs> Suddenly, the place starts shaking, and this black heart emerges from that altar, which Black calls the Chaos Heart. 
He also mentions the Dark Prognosticus, so we know who the latest owner of this book is. Suddenly, Luigi appears. He was apparently passed out in the crowd, but just woke up to all this happening. He attempts to say Peach, but in doing so, he jumps on the Chaos Heart, which I'm not sure what it does. But in the end, Black still has it, and is still able to use it for whatever he has planned, which seems to be to destroy all worlds. And then we see the title screen. All this happened before the title screen even appeared. Talk about Instant Hook. Imagine you just pick this game up not knowing anything about it. You turn it on and this is the first thing you see. So many questions. How did this all happen? Why were Peach and Bowser getting married? Where is Mario? Who is Count Black and why does he want to destroy all worlds? Questions that do get answered. Some very quickly. But this does a really good job at making you want to know the answers. This has to be one of the greatest openings to a game ever, and probably the best opening to a Mario game. Alright, let's back it up a bit. Once you start the game, you see what happened leading up to this scene. This is rather familiar. We see Mario and Luigi chilling in their house like the last two games. It's a peaceful day. A bit too peaceful, as Luigi kinda wishes for some kinda shocking event. Oh, he'll get it, alright. Mario suggests they go pay Peach a visit. But before they could really go anywhere, Toad arrives in a panic with some terrible news. It's sh 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 shocking! Mushroom Castle raided! Princess Peach stolen! What? Why, that's ridiculous! Who in the world would do such a thing? Wait a second. Yeah, I think I've got it. Bro, this must be the work of that guy. That bad guy. As you can see, the writing in this game is exquisite. I mean, Peach being kidnapped was played out even by the first Paper Mario, and these games have been doing unique stuff with the concept, but it's just hilarious when they make fun of it. So they go off to that bad guy's castle, and he's in the middle of a speech when he notices the bros in the crowd and confronts them. They ask where Peach is, but he doesn't know because he hasn't even launched his attack yet. But then Peach appears in some kind of barrier right before Count Black arrives. He was the one who kidnapped the princess this time, and explains that she will be used to destroy all worlds. Mario leaps into action, but is unable to hurt the Count, who effortlessly knocks out Mario. That bad guy has had enough and demands Peach be released, to which the Count responds by taking everyone here except Mario. Well, this explains how everyone got to that wedding, but right away, Count Black is quite an interesting villain. I've heard some people say he is a bit boring at the beginning, and he only gets interesting later, but I don't get that. The standard Mario stuff is going on, and this dude just barges into it, outright says he's gonna destroy all worlds, then sets up this wedding for Peach and that bad guy. This guy gives one hell of a first impression that you're just dying to learn more about him. I guess the part people think is uninteresting is his supposed plan to destroy all worlds, and that before they dive deeper into his motivations and flesh him out more, it's just your standard destroy the world because evil villain. I can sort of see that, but the story has only begun, and they're not gonna just tell you his life story right away. Gotta build up to that. I figure a lot of great villains would be pretty uninteresting if we simply judged them by their introductions before we learn more about them. Oh well, it's not like people really think this guy's generic. As we'll see, this isn't your standard Mario villain. Mario lay unconscious in that bad guy's castle while the wedding is going on, when he gets woken up by this weird butterfly who knows his name. Her name is Tippy and she's a pixel, a sort of fairy, apparently. She seems to know what Count Black is up to, and takes Mario away to this place where he meets Merlin. There's quite a bit of exposition here, so let me summarize. This place is called Flipside. It's a town that doesn't reside in any dimension, but is instead in between dimensions. Wrap your head around that. Merlin is a descendant of the Ancients that created this town, and he is the holder of the Light Prognosticus. We don't learn everything about it right now, but I'll just go over it all anyways. Now, as has been established, the Dark Prognosticus was a book of prophecies of the future. One prophecy in particular tells of the end of all worlds. This has already been set in motion, as you can see, a void has appeared in the sky. Think of the void as a big black hole, one that keeps getting bigger. It will continue to grow and consume entire dimensions until it has consumed every single dimension. And since we can see it in flip side, that means it will get everything in between dimensions as well. This void, when it has completed its task, will have erased all of existence. That is a pretty dire situation we're in, isn't it? 
Now how has the Void come to be? Well, it's created by the Chaos Art that Black summoned at the wedding, and it is summoned by the union of a fair and lovely princess and a furious monster king, which explains why the wedding even took place. The ancients knew about this prophecy, but were unable to stop it, so they devised a plan to prevent it. Thus, the Purity Heart was created. It housed the pure essence of love, and it would counter the Chaos Heart. The ancients took the Purity Heart and split it into eight pieces, which are called Pure Hearts. They then hid these Pure Hearts in eight different dimensions for safekeeping. One of the ancestors, Marlumina, wrote the Light Prognosticus, which is a counter to the Dark One. The Light Prognosticus tells of a hero who will collect the Pure Hearts and use them to prevent the end of all worlds by destroying the one controlling the Chaos Heart. Only then will the Void vanish. Interesting thing to note, the Light Prognosticus only tells of one hero, but when talking to Merle, she mentions something wasn't written down, that there are four heroes. At least that's what she says, but later Merlin mentions something written in the Light Prognosticus that references there being more than one hero, specifically the last hero. Well anyways, that sounds pretty good, right? I mean, the Light Prognosticus tells how the Dark One is wrong since it's a counter to it. No need to worry, it's already written down how we'll win. Well, here's the thing about the Light Prognosticus. It's not actually prophetic. The Dark Prognosticus is a book of prophecies. It tells the future. It isn't just about the end of all worlds. That's just the last prophecy in it. The Light Prognosticus isn't special. It doesn't tell the future. It was only written as a theoretical way of preventing the end of all worlds. It isn't showing you that the prophecy is stopped. It's telling you a possible way to stop it but it isn't guaranteed. That's pretty grim, isn't it? So that means there's no hope if the book that tells of how the end of all worlds is stopped is not prophetic, while the one that tells that prophecy to begin with is actually prophetic, right? Well, the Dark Prognosticus actually does talk about the hero, and seems to indicate that it is possible for it to be undone. So it's really uncertain which is true. Obviously, we know what will happen in the end, but that's not the point. Now, all that information is spread across the game. You'll get bits and pieces of it as you progress. You don't get it all right away. Just felt it would flow better to talk about it this way instead of in bits and pieces. At the start, Merlin only tells you about the Void and that you need to collect the Pure Hearts. He already has a Pure Heart and gives it to Mario, which you can refuse and get a game over. <laughs> that is hilarious. But if you accept it and place it on the Heart Pillar, it creates a door that will lead to the next pure heart. Just like the crystal stars, each pure heart leads to the next. And now we know the way this will be structured. Mario and Tippy enter the first door, get the pure heart, which leads to the next one, and this continues until you have them all. Like the previous games, each chapter has its own story to it, some not even really connecting to the main plot outside of there being a pure heart, or one of Black's minions attacks you at some point. But really, for most of the chapters, especially the early chapters, there really isn't much in the way of a story. Technically, chapter one has a story, I guess? But it's just Mario makes his way to these ruins, fights the guardian of the pure heart who was friendly at first since he recognized you as the hero, but is attacking because one of Black's minions used magic to make it malfunction, and then you talk to Merlumina. That's it. Not much to talk about here, really. And while some future chapters do have more story, it's still not as much as, say, chapters 3 or 4 from Thousand Year Door. The story, at least from Mario's perspective, doesn't really pick up until chapter 6. Not to say there aren't important things happening in some of the other chapters, but it doesn't require going over the entirety of those chapters to talk about those important parts. So we're going to be skimming over the first five chapters here, and only talking about the important parts. But first, much like the previous games, in between chapters there are these interludes showing what the villains are up to. While the chapters themselves are rather light on the plot, these interludes pick up the slack. These interludes involve Black discussing the unfolding events with his minions. It's through these scenes we are introduced to O Chunks, a lumbering brute who lacks in the brain department, Mimi, who is a shapeshifter, we don't actually see her true form until encountering her in Chapter 2, and Dementio, a rather mysterious magician. These are Black's minions and are recurring enemies you face. 
Through these scenes, we see that, for the most part, they are extremely loyal to Count Black, and they aren't even being brainwashed by Nastasia. We also get more insight on these characters, especially Black and Nastasia, though I'll go over characters in more detail later. We hear that Black's plan is erase all worlds and create perfect new worlds in their place without war or conflict. He also promises to make his minions' wishes come true, which does explain their loyalty. For the first few interludes, we mostly just see who will be fighting next. The first one shows them discovering that the hero exists and sending Ochunks to fight Mario. The second is Ochunks apologizing for his failure, and then they send Mimi. The third is sending Dementio, and the fourth is sending a mysterious fourth minion. This might sound formulaic and boring, but there's a lot more to these scenes. They are very character driven. It's more about getting to know more about them, while also building up mystery. On the surface, Splek may seem like your generic could destroy the world because evil type villain, but there are more layers to him, and you get a bit of a hint that something isn't quite right about him in these first few interludes, especially the one after Chapter 3, where Nastasia, who is the most loyal to him as we'll see later, seemingly attempts to talk him out of going through with the plan. She doesn't put much of an effort into it, and when Black responds by allowing her to leave, she refuses, stating her life is sworn to him. Nastasia is probably the most interesting of Black's minions. During another interlude, she lets this slip. If only I could have, you know, been that girl, things would have been different. To which Black responds with, She cannot be replaced. You could never hope to do so, Nastasia. To be sure, she is gone. Gone from all worlds, never to return. Very interesting. It is through Nastasia that we get more insight on Black and start piecing together what his motivation truly is. But the last thing to add onto these first few interludes is for two of them, you get to play as Peach and Luigi. They play out pretty similarly. They wake up in Black's castle after the wedding, meet a couple of that bad guy's minions, learn that they are getting mind controlled, and try to escape with the friendly ones. Although they end differently, Peach gets cornered but is suddenly teleported away. Luigi is not so lucky. We quickly see what happens to Peach. She appears in Flipside, and after waking her up, she decides to join Mario. We learn that there are multiple heroes, so Peach has to be the second one. We don't see what happened to Luigi for a little bit. The interlude before Chapter 4 has Black mentioning they're sending someone we haven't seen before. We find out that this new villain is the mysterious Mr. L, aka the Green Thunder. He looks kind of familiar, I wonder who he really is. At this point he joins in on the interludes, though he doesn't stay too long, but we'll get to that. It seems he's quite important to the prophecy. We don't see that bad guy in these interludes at all. In fact, Mario and Peach just find him in Chapter 3. And after some peaceful negotiations, he is convinced to join them, becoming the third hero. Another thing that happens in between the chapters is this dialogue that at first seems to not be related to anything. It's between two characters, Lord Blumiere of the Tribe of Darkness and Lady Timpany, who is human. These characters are very significant, and it isn't very hard to figure out who they are, but for now, it's a mystery. So far, what we know is Timpany had helped Blumiere after he took a fall. At first, he's confused why she would help him, given what he is, but she doesn't care. They start to fall in love, but Blumiere's father seems to have an issue and may have done something to Timpany, as she attempts to leave him despite loving him. But then Blumiere decides to run away with her, and proposes to which she accepts. And that's as far as I'll go over now. But getting to the important points of the main chapters leading up to chapter 6. Nothing too important in the first two aside from talking to Merlumina and Merle, who give more info on the Pure Hearts and Light Prognosticus. But I already went over it. Chapter 3's main plot is Tippy gets captured by this nerd guy, and at the end when she's rescued, the Pure Heart appears out of nowhere. Turns out, it had a seal on it that could only be released by a pulse of love and trust, which Tippy had experienced after being saved. This actually starts a bit of a shift in her character. She's more trusting, and is generally more cheerful. Peach even points this out. One important part is after Chapter 4, Tippy suddenly faints. Doesn't take long for her to recover, but we do learn something rather important about her. She used to be a human, but Merlin found her near death. She had been cursed to wander dimensions. Merlin was able to save her by putting her into a pixel, but in doing that, she lost her memories. Throughout these chapters, you will encounter Black's minions. 
nothing much is added to the overall story with most of these encounters, aside from Mr. L, obviously, but Dementio is quite the suspicious character. While the others are quite loyal to Black, and Dementio also appears loyal, but he seems to have his own agenda. I think the game could have been a little more subtle with drawing suspicion to him, though. It seems like he might be testing you. In any case, one important thing involving him is in check. Five. O-Chunks is about to fight you when Dementio appears and helps him out by putting you in this alternate dimension, but you still win. O-Chunks, feeling ashamed that he lost you twice, actually requests you to finish him off to retain some honor. But before anything could happen, Dementio appears again and talks O-Chunks out of it by offering him something that could aid the Count. Now you do run into these two again later, but this requires some context. In this chapter, a race of plants known as Florosapiens have been kidnapping the local cave people, the Kragnons. Most of this chapter you're chasing them back to their lair. When you get there, it turns out the kidnapped Kragnons are being mind controlled with these sprouts on their heads. Now the reason for all this was because the Kragnons were polluting the water, and the Floro King, King Crocus, went mad from it. But when you encounter Dementio, he uses one of the sprouts on Oat Chunks and has you fight him again. Just what is Dementio up to? But that's about all the important stuff that happens regarding the main plot in the first five chapters. Chapter 6 is when things get real. Things are a little different in the interlude leading up to Chapter 6. The scenes usually focus on Black interacting with his minions. He is the main focus. But Black isn't here this time. It's just Nastasia punishing O-Chunks for failing again. Mimi and Mr. L both want to go after the heroes. But Nastasia says that Black ordered them to stay in the castle. No one is allowed to leave, and she's very insistent on having them obey these orders. Mimi and Mr. L aren't too happy about that, but then Dementio arrives and not so subtly says that they definitely shouldn't disobey Black's orders, even though stopping the hero would really make him happy, but they really shouldn't do it. Then they all leave, Dementio included. Before we actually go into Chapter 6, Let's talk about something important. Throughout the game, you've seen the void in the background. It's always there, reminding you of what's coming. Kind of like the moon in Majora's Mask. The game doesn't let you forget what's at stake. And actually, you see it a lot more than the moon, given that the game is 2D. Now, so far, aside from just being visible, it hasn't done anything to you yet. It does grow every now and then, showing you that time is running out. But unlike Majora, there isn't actually a time limit. So, it's easy to forget about the impending doom in the background. You don't see what the results will be if you don't stop it. Well, that's about to change. Welcome to the Samur Kingdom. As soon as you get here, you can see the void is enormous. This world is close to destruction. Going forward, you fight one of the Samur guys, and then learn from King Samur that he is the holder of the pure heart. But before you can have it, you need to fight all 100 of his Samur guy vassals. With the void as big as it is here, the fact that Tippy pointed that out and now you have to go through a series of 100 fights just to get the pure heart, you know something big is going to happen. You fight, and fight, and fight. So many battles go by, you start getting into a rhythm. You stop thinking about the void, and instead are focusing on getting this tournament over with. But then you get to the 20th fight, and the void grows even larger, reminding you that time is running out. But before you can get a move on, Count Black himself appears to you for the first time since the opening. It is already far too late to stop, Count Black. The light of each world will be snuffed out one by one. Tippy and Black get into a debate here, and we get some more insight on Black. This worthless world's destruction matters not. Far better for Count Black to wipe it out of existence than let it remain. But then we get this exchange. Count Black scoffs at you. An insignificant pixel lectures Count Black on what is right and wrong. This is not up for discussion. You're wrong and sick. All living things have a heart. They're all priceless. You can't just erase them. Of all things, you defend the heart. 
Nothing could be more worthless. All things are meaningless. Aside from timpani, no treasure mattered in the least to me. Well, that's quite a bombshell. If Black knows Tiffany, and she's the thing he treasured the most, well that means Count Black is Bloomy Air. This also means something happened to Timpany, and Black's motivation is becoming very clear. And with one last taunt and his signature laugh, he leaves you to continue the tournament. But the void keeps getting bigger. Tremors happen every few seconds now. The situation is so dire, even the Samur guys realize there's no point in delaying you, so they let you pass. Eventually, you run into King Samur, who is actually Mimi setting a trap. You beat her up, but it doesn't matter. She was only there to delay you. They continue forward as the void grows more and more, each passing samurai guy panicking more than the last, more desperate to get you to get to the king. At first, they give you their usual introductory speech before telling you to go, but now they don't bother. Fly to King Samur! Now! Go to the king! Until you reach this one, who's just lost it. The void grows bigger and bigger until... <laughs> You wake up in Flipside. Tippy seems to have known Black at one point, but that's not important right now. Somehow, they made it out of there before the Void got them. But what about the Samur Kingdom? Well, the door to it is still there. With some hesitation, they decide to go through again. And this is what they find. Nothing. There's nothing left. I'll go into more detail about this event later, but for now. This is the most significant moment in the story, and one of the most shocking events ever in a video game. This entire sequence was masterfully done, establishing the lack of time right before putting a huge roadblock in a big time sink and having you defeat 100 opponents. But then, when the repetition sinks in and it becomes routine, they pull the rug out from under you, reminding you of the threat, increasingly raising the tension as the residents become more desperate as they lose hope and finally panic. And then, after you've spent all this time talking to and battling these characters, it's all destroyed. But instead of just saying it's destroyed and moving on, you are forced to go back and see what is left, which isn't much. It's a shock to see such a cool place, full of life, reduced to this. And it wakes you up to what is really at stake. This is gonna happen to everything if you don't stop Black. And just to rub it in, you have to walk through this nothingness for a while before you get to the pure heart. You have to look at all this emptiness, see the few remnants of what once was to again remind you that this place is gone, destroyed, erased, wiped from existence. And you have to hear this chilling music, which if you pay close attention to, you hear what seems to be a heart rate monitor that then flatlines. The Samur Kingdom is dead. Eventually, you do find the Pure Heart, but it is far from in a good state. Before you can pick it up, Mr. L comes in and takes it. He then challenges you with his new Brobot L-Type, but even with the improvements, it doesn't last long. Tippy then calls Mr. L weak, and he runs off. I'm not weak. I'm... I'm not. I'm not weak. I am not weak. You get the pure heart, but before going back to Flipside, we see Mr. L by himself, frustrated by losing twice, when Dementio appears. There's a short exchange where Mr. L says, I'm a disgrace. There's no way I can show my face to Count Black after this. To which Dementio agrees and attacks Mr. L. You said it yourself. You can't go back to the Count now. So get lost. I can't have you around the Count. If I am rid of you here, 
I won't be found out. Dementio then traps Mr. L in this box and blows him up with no trace of him left. Mr. L was presumably just killed. And remember, this is right after an entire dimension got erased. As you can tell, this game got really dark really fast. And also, what is up with Dementio? The dude has been pretty suspicious throughout the game, but this just takes the cake. But that's not all. This game isn't done throwing punches. The next interlude is Nastasia reporting on how Mr. L and Mimi disobeyed orders by leaving. They don't explicitly say Mr. L is dead, but Flex's remark about the prophecy requiring sacrifice tells me he knows. Nastasia seems to have noticed a change with Bleck, but Bleck denies it and demands to be left alone. But when he is alone, he says this. Could that pixel have been timpani? No, no, completely impossible. I should know better than anyone. Besides, it's far too late to do anything now. The prophecy has been set in motion and no one, not even I, can stop it. No one can stop this now. Well now, isn't that interesting? Black seems to think Tippy might be timpani, and you can feel some conflict in him. After that, we see a change with the Blumier timpani segment. Timpani is not there. Something has happened to her. Blumier demands to know where she is from his father, who is very angry that his son fell for a human, saying he brought shame to his name and the entire tribe of darkness. Blumier doesn't care. He only cares about Timpani. But it seems his father has done something to her, to where she no longer resides in this world. As the heroes get back to Flipside and show Merlin what happened to the Pure Heart, he determines that it probably wouldn't respond when put on the Pure Heart. It's lost its power. But then Dementio shows up, tells them that this has all been for nothing. There's no way in this world to restore the Pure Heart. Then he gives Mario Peach and that bad guy the same treatment he gave Mr. L. Mario dies. Legit. This actually happens. Mario then wakes up in hell. No, seriously, he dies and goes to hell. This place is called the Underwear. The place where people go when their games are over. There are demon. Get it? Demon. There's the River Twigs. Get it? Like the River Sticks. The ruler is Jades. Like Hades. And to top it off, there's a much nicer place called the Over There, where if you've lived a good life, you go there instead of suffering in the underwear. Mario is in hell. Mario is in denial, so he goes over to Queen Jades, who is about to weigh Mario's sins to see if he can go to the Over There. But then she senses the pure heart on him. She also seems to know what it is, and asks how he has it and how it got in this damaged state. But before she can get an answer, her phone rings. It turns out the ruler of the Over There is her husband, and their daughter, Love Bee, has gone missing. Jadis then gets the idea to have Mario go and find Love Bee since she can't abandon her duties. Before sending Mario off, she takes the pure heart, promising to give it back when you're done. She also suggests you start by checking the bottom of the river, as someone wearing Green had fallen down there recently. She knows it isn't Love B, but just in case, that is where you start. Going down there, Mario finds Luigi. How did he get here? We haven't seen him since he got caught by Nastasia. I wonder if Mr. L is nearby. Anyways, with the two of them reunited, they find Love B, who's a bit of a brat. But upon returning with her, Jadis rewards you with a restored pure heart. She has the power over life and death, so she was able to fix it. Also, I went on about Mario being dead, but JD says that apparently you haven't actually died, and somehow got sent to the underwear while still alive. And with that, she sends the two of you back to the land of the living. Hmm. Mario and company were at their lowest point. They failed to retrieve the pure heart before the Void destroyed the Samur Kingdom, and were left with the heart-shaped rock with no hope of continuing. But then Dementio kills them, but all that did was reunite Mario with Luigi and restore the pure heart, all with them not actually being dead. That's a bit convenient. But so they get back and reunite with Tippy, although they're still missing Peach and that bad guy. And that was chapter six. We still have two chapters left. Though chapter seven is like previous chapters where not a whole lot important in the main plot happens, Though of all the previous ones, this one has more of its own story. You go through the next door, and where do you end up? Right back in the underwear. They go to Jadis and explain that you're looking for the pure heart. And she seems really shocked by this, but she also knows about the prognosticus. She won't tell you where the pure heart is but that you'll have to talk to Gramby, the king of the Over There, to know. Jadis then gets an idea. She wants you to escort Love Bee to the Over There because a monster had recently been freed from its prison. So you climb out of the underwear, all while Love Bee is constantly getting under Tippy's skin, 
They then find that bad guy and have to fight him because he doesn't quite know what's going on and thinks you're trying to separate him from Peach. But eventually he calms down and rejoins you. They get to the over there stair where they find Peach and finally with everyone back together you get to the over there and it's overrun by skeletons. They fight their way through helping out the various NIMBYs along the way, even starting an all out battle between the two forces. And finally get to Granby and the monster that escaped from the underwear, Bone Chill. Bone Chill is trying to find the Pure Heart, and this is where he drops quite the bombshell. The Pure Heart is Love Bee. Apparently, Granby, in order to hide the Pure Heart, turned it into Love Bee. Tippy interrupts, telling Love Bee to take Granby to safety while they deal with Bone Chill. After that, Love Bee demands to know if what the monster said was true. Before he can answer, Jadies arrives, and Love Bee then asks her, It is true. The two of them created Love Bee to hide the Pure Heart. The Pure Heart then seems to appear in her. It's trying to assume its original form. We get a long exchange between Love Bee and Granby, mostly of them arguing. It, it's kind of hard to watch. But eventually they stop, and Love Bee apologizes before accepting her responsibility as the Pure Heart. Granby really takes this hard. But once she finally turns back into the pure heart, Granby presents it to you. Man, this game got really emotional. We spent the whole chapter with this character, and she's essentially dead now. A Thousand Year Door had emotional moments, but with the exception of hearing about Bobbery's wife, it's more on the happy side. Hearing about Coops' father, and then it turns out he's alive in the end and it's all happy. Hearing about Jolene losing her brother, and then he comes back and it's all happy. Things seem dire at the end, but then all the people you meet along the way start cheering you on and it's super uplifting. This right here isn't happy. It's not even bittersweet. Sure, you got the pure heart, but at the cost of Luffy, at the cost of parents losing their only daughter. Sure, they may have created Luffy to protect the pure heart, but they still came to love her as a true daughter. And they've had to accept that to save all worlds, they need to let her die. I can't think of another Mario game with this kind of punch to the gut. And this is why this story is so special. But we're not done yet. Black is surprised by the news that the heroes still live, and sends each of his minions to protect the castle. They all go off except Dementio, who asks Black if the name Blumier rings a bell. He overheard Tippy mentioning Blumier, though he then just waves it off and leaves. But this confirms to Black that Tippy is indeed Timpani. With this, Nastasia urges Black to stop the prophecy, but he reminds her that it can't be stopped. She keeps trying to get him to end it, but he's too far gone. The man known as Blumier died long ago. Now there is only Black, the dark prognosticus's choice to fulfill the prophecy, nothing more. Come to Count Black Heroes. If you hope to save these worlds, then come. In the last Blumier section, we see his turn to Count Black his father warning his son to stay away from the Dark Prognosticus, but he doesn't listen. As soon as he opens the book is when he becomes Count Black, and is now set on fulfilling the prophecy. Back in Flipside, Tippy is just yelling about Blumier, not even realizing what's happening. She eventually snaps out of it, but this is also further confirmation that she is Timpani. Although you'd already have known that well before this point, it's easy to guess even before she says Blumier by accident. Though at this point I think she might have gotten back all her memories, or at least most of them. But the heroes are ready to face the Count. One last door opens, leading to Castle Black. They progress through the castle until they reach Ho Chunks. This time, that bad guy. Okay, I'll stop calling him that. Bowser decides he's going to take him on by himself, which he does. And after the battle, the ceiling collapses, but Ho Chunks stops it and lets them pass since they beat him. Bowser, not wanting to be outdone, holds up the ceiling and tells the Mario Bros to get Peach out of there, which they do. And then he and Ho Chunks start arguing about who should leave. But then eventually they give out, and the others outside hear the impact. Bowser is gone. It's just the three of them. Though Peach isn't worried given he survived worse. Continuing through the castle, they notice that tremors keep happening, and Peach wonders why Black would let the Void destroy this place as well. This confirms to Tippy that Black is indeed Bloomy Air. Eventually they run into Mimi, and a similar thing with Ochunks happens. Mimi insults Peach, who then decides to fight alone. Afterwards, a trap is sprung with Peach attempting to save Mimi, but is unsuccessful. And now Peach is gone. 
Going farther, they run into Dementio, who then sends them on a wild goose chase, teleporting you to all the places you've been to, including the ruined Samur Kingdom, to give you that grim reminder once more. When that's done, we get some rather interesting info from Dementio. He asks if you will help him destroy Count Black. He reveals that while Black had told them he would build a perfect world after destroying all other worlds, but Dementio knew that his actual plan was to destroy everything, and then leave them in ruin. He always knew this. He was only pretending to be loyal while he found someone capable of beating him, which is you. And he has been secretly helping you the entire time. Notice how when anyone teleports they do it like this. Dementio is the exception. He has a unique way of teleporting. And when Peach is teleported out of the castle... Oh, look at that. Dementio did it. It does seem awfully convenient that him killing you ended up working out in the best way. That's because he knew the only way to fix the pure heart was for Jades to do it. And he also took the opportunity to free Luigi and sent him down there to be reunited with Mario. So he asks you to fight by his side, but he's still super suspicious, so you say no. And after refusing the first time, he says they can rule the world if they get the Chaos Heart. So you know you made the right call. And now, same deal as before. He insults Luigi. Luigi then tells Mario to go ahead while he fights Dementio. Afterwards, Dementio kamikazes the both of them, and you've lost Luigi. Mario is now alone, and next up is Count Black. Black and Tippy exchange some words. Not much interesting is said until Tippy says, If the worlds have no meaning, was our meeting meaningless as well? Answer me, Bloomy Air. You know the answer, dear Timpany. Count Black does not have to tell you. But the hour has grown too late. You should know that by now. You can tell he has a lot of regret for what he's done, but it is already too late to stop it, so he has to continue it. Bloomy Air and Count Black are struggling against each other. After ordering Nastasia away, the battle begins. But it isn't much of a battle since Black is protected by the Chaos Heart. With that barrier, nothing Mario does can get through. As Black is about to finish this, Bowser, Peach, and Luigi, who have all survived, appear to help out. The reunion summons the pure hearts, which are able to nullify Black's barrier. And now the true battle begins. Black is finally defeated, but the Chaos Heart won't go away until the wielder is destroyed. He asks you to finish him, Timpany obviously not wanting to. It's here where Blumier is fully back, and he talks about how after she disappeared, the world held no meaning or joy, and that he wanted to destroy everything that took her away from him. But now seeing her alive, and the world she'll live in will continue, gives him peace and he is ready to die to undo the prophecy. Before anything can be done, Dementio attacks Blumier, but Nastasia blocks the shot. Dementio swoops in and says that even if the Count dies, the Chaos Heart won't disappear if he continues to control it. This was his master plan, to have you use up the Pure Hearts to defeat Black so he can take the Chaos Heart for himself. But he still has another trick up his sleeve. When he blew himself and Luigi up earlier, he planted one of those mind control sprouts so it can emerge now. Wait, Luigi is Mr. L? No, that's stupid. But then he throws the Chaos Heart, which absorbs Luigi to create this monstrosity. He does this because the Dark Prognosticus says he's the best host for the Chaos Heart's power. After sending Blumier, Timpany, and Nastasia to his other dimension, he then merges with it himself and becomes Super Dementio. With his new body and power, he plans to destroy all worlds and then create perfect worlds to become the king of all worlds. This escalated very quickly. Super Dementio is invincible, and they can't use Pure Hearts again, since they were already used against Count Black. It seems they are a one-time use. Back in Dimension D, Blumier has given up hope of defeating Dementio, since they don't have the Pure Hearts. But Timpany is insistent that there must be a way. Mimi and Ochunks then appear to give support. They are still as loyal as ever, and in this moment the Pure Hearts reappear. As Timpany puts it, Pure Hearts are the very feeling of our souls. As long as we feel love, they live on. She then takes them to Mario and uses them to make Dementio vulnerable. With this, they are able to defeat him, but he still has one trick up his sleeve. As he is destroyed and Luigi gets freed, he left a shadow of his power to continue to control the Chaos Heart. It will last just long enough to destroy all worlds. Blumier devises a plan to use the Pure Hearts one more time to banish the Chaos Heart, but to get them to reappear, he needs Timpany's help. 
And unfortunately, in doing this, those tied to the pure hearts will cease to exist. But the two of them are prepared for that, and they have a marriage ceremony. They declare their love for each other, which brings the pure hearts back once more, and finally, put an end to this. With the Chaos Heart gone, the Void closes, saving all worlds from destruction, and even restoring those already destroyed. The Chaos Heart was summoned by the union of two who were never meant to be together, and the Chaos Heart is banished by the union of two who were never meant to be apart. There's one last scene of the heroes and former enemies. Nastasia is alive and believes that Blumier and Timpani are still alive and happy somewhere. And we see just that after the credits with this beautiful image. <laughs> That was the plot. It is quite different from any other Mario story, in a very good way. But I'm not done talking about the story, not even close. It is easily the deepest story of the series, hell, probably of all Mario in general. And there's much more to discuss. Now I've heard criticisms of this story not being very Mario-like, and that this doesn't feel like a Mario story. I can easily see how this doesn't feel like a Mario story, but I don't understand how this is a problem. To me, Mario as a concept has always represented pure creativity and imagination. All these wacky and weird worlds, colorful cast of characters, and sheer multitude of different genres that Mario has been a part of, it's all creativity and imagination. It's because of this I find certain aspects of Mario that are more standardized to be very disappointing. To take these more creative and expressive designs and make them look like everything else. The new Super Mario Bros. series speaks for itself when it comes to standardization and the lack of creativity and imagination harming Mario. Mario can be anything. Mario should be anything. He isn't restricted in genre of gameplay, and so he shouldn't be restricted in genre of storytelling. Sure, this story isn't very Mario-like, but that aspect makes it very Mario-like, because it's creative and it's imaginative. To be honest, this is the kind of storytelling I wish would happen more often in Mario games. Perhaps the wordiness of this game wouldn't be suited to a main Mario platformer, but the raised stakes, the drama, the mystery, the unique villains, the unusual worlds and characters that inhabit them, the tension, the raw emotions, all that I think can fit in if they put the effort in. Not saying all Mario should be like this, that would go against my whole Mario represents creativity and imagination thing. You can certainly be creative and imaginative with simple plots. I think they've gotten better with that with Odyssey. I'm just saying, wouldn't it be great to have a story like this in a big 3D Mario platformer? But let's get into the details, starting with the world, or in this case, worlds. Much like the previous games, there are many locations to visit, and also like them, you have a main town that you spend quite a bit of time in, Flipside. Unfortunately, I don't find Flipside to be very interesting. It has a unique look, its own unique residence, its own unique backstory with being built by the ancients. It has a unique mirrored half called Flopside. In this half, everything is reversed, even the people who live there looking similar, but different in some way. This even extends to their personalities. But I just never got nearly as invested in this place or the people who live in it nearly as much as I did for Rogueport or even Toad Town. I think there are a few factors. Some that tie into other aspects of the game I'll talk about later. But I think the main issue is you are hardly ever required to interact with it beyond finding the heart pillars and the act of finding them doesn't really do enough to get you to care about the towns. Let's look back at the previous games and compare how you enter each chapter. In the first game, to get to chapter 1, you need to get past these shady looking toads. To do that, you talk to Merlin and he helps you out by exposing them as the Koopa Bros. You've interacted with a resident of the town to get to chapter 1. In Thousand Year Door, to get to chapter 1, you explore the underground area of town using a new ability you got to get to a new area, then fought a giant blooper to get to a pipe to chapter 1. You've interacted with the town itself and fought some creatures to get there. In Super Paper Mario, as soon as you get to Flipside, you are given the first pure heart, and you place it on the heart pillar to create a door to chapter 1. Not quite as exciting, is it? Well, for the first two games, they keep having you interact with the towns and the people in it. 
In the first game, you destroy a rock blocking the train tracks leading to the dry, dry desert. You help out a big tuna in the pier by getting the fuzzipede out of his stomach, and he repays you by taking you to Lava Lava Island. You also team up with Colorado when going there. You help this girl with her garden by finding the bulb bulbs and getting their magic seeds, which open up a door to the flower fields. And let's not forget the time a bunch of shy guys start causing mischief around town and stealing stuff from everyone, so you go around stopping them and trying to find where they're coming from. And when you do, you're still not done interacting with the town. That entire chapter is based on going back and forth between the toy box and Toad Town, getting the stolen items and returning them to their owners to be able to progress further in the toy box. And then there's Thousand Year Door. You need to get through the Pianta Syndicate a couple times to get tickets for a blimp and train, talk to this guy to figure out how to use the pipe that leads to his town, and recruit a bunch of sailors to help you get to Keel Hall Key. It's this kind of stuff that gets you to care about a town and the people living in it. But for Super, to get to Chapter 2, you find the Heart Pillar and place the Pure Heart on it. To get to Chapter 3, you find the Heart Pillar and place the Pure Heart on it. To get to Chapter 4, you find the Heart Pillar and place the Pure Heart on it. To get to Chapter 5, you find the Heart Pillar and place the... Okay, you get it. You might think, what's so different in this from some of the ways you get to different chapters in Thousand Year Door? Yeah, you do use your abilities to explore parts of the town to find the thing that you need to get to the next chapter in both, but the method is different for each one. This also applies to the first game. In Super, it's the same every time. Plus, only like a couple of heart pillars are in town. Most of them are in the outskirts of town, and you hardly ever need to interact with the people. To be fair, there are a couple times you do. When Peach appears in town, she's unconscious, and to wake her up, you go to Saffron and have her cook some spicy soup. And for Chapter 4, it's in space, and you can't breathe in space, so you have to get something like a helmet. Merlin did have one, but he gave it to some kids, so you find that kid and it's a fishbowl. He wants you to find a new home for Captain Gill since he's gotten too big for the bowl. When you do, you have your space helmet. This is the kind of stuff the game needed more of. This is the kind of stuff that makes you care about the people around you. After doing this, I'll tell you I do care about that kid and Captain Gills now. Especially since as you progress through the game, Captain Gills keeps getting bigger and eventually has kids. Only thing left to mention about Flipside is just like Thousand Year Door, there's an NPC that gives you some extra lore. And he has a Flopside variant. There's a bigger variety of topics, unlike the one from Thousand Year Door where it was all related to the events from a thousand years ago. Here you'll get info on the Ancients, Flipside, Flopside, the Tribe of Darkness, Pixels, the Dark Prognosticus, and Count Black and his minions. I won't go over all these topics here, but instead wait until they're relevant. Overall, some very interesting stuff to read here, but Flipside is just one world. Let's go over the other worlds. Unfortunately, these worlds are the weakest aspect of this story, and a lot of it has to do with the genre shift. I'll go over the shift later. But the results are the worlds feeling a lot less like real places that people live in. It's kind of like standard Mario games, where most of the world feels super arbitrary, and there are fewer towns, which means fewer characters. Now this wouldn't be much of an issue in any other Mario game, except this is the one Mario game where every world is in danger of being erased. To make you care about the worlds being destroyed, you first need to care about the worlds themselves. And I don't think this game does nearly as good of a job as it could. I only really care about half of the worlds in this game. I don't care about Lineland, I don't care about Gloam Valley, or the Bitlands, or Outer Space. I just don't. I do care a bit more about the Land of the Kragnons, because we actually spend more time talking to the Kragnons and the Sabre Kingdom for obvious reasons. And the Underwear and Over There, because once again you interact with the people that live there. But that's the thing. The first four worlds don't have enough interactions with the locals for me to care about them. Sure, Lineland has the old town, but you go there once and you don't stay very long. Gloam Valley has these guys in Merley's mansion, but again, you don't spend much time with them. The only thing I care about in the Bitlands is Francis. That's it. And the only thing in space I care about is Squirps because you spend a whole chapter with him. Nothing else. Yeah, I sure don't want this big empty space with random blocks and spinning shapes to be destroyed. It's like, would you really care if World 5-1 or whatever was destroyed? Who would? You wouldn't. That's the issue I'm having with the worlds. And it isn't an issue with the story, but rather an issue with how the story conflicts with the gameplay. Unfortunately, it does have an effect, even if it's a small effect, because the void itself is reliant on you caring about what it will destroy. Let's compare the scene where it shows the void beginning to destroy all worlds to the scene in Thousand Year Door when the Shadow Queen is being resurrected. Once the Shadow Queen appears, the world is covered in a sheet of darkness followed by an earthquake. 
and it shows this to you by showing each location you've been to, all the various towns, and it shows you the people who live there reacting to it. And then when all hope is lost, the crystal stars fly off to these locations, and it's through them that all these people cheer you on, which weakens the Shadow Queen, allowing you to win. And this works! because you care about these places. You care about these people. You care about Petalburg because that's where you met Coops and helped him on his quest to defeat Hooktail and save his father. You care because you care about Coops. You care about the Bogley tree because you befriended Punio and helped him free the other punies and drive the x knots out of the tree. You care because you care about Punio and the other punies. You care about Glitzville because you fought through the ranks, met so many fighters, befriended some of them, and helped Jolene stop Grubba and save her brother. You care because you care about Jolene, Rockhawk, King K, and the other fighters. I could do this for all the chapters in that game. Each location has things to care about. The people living in these places are more than just background decoration. You interact with them. You help them out. You go on a journey with them. There's also the Trouble Center. You get a bunch of side quests from people in all these locations, which adds to their character as well. Now let's look at Super. After failing to hurt Super Dementio, we get a somewhat similar scene to the one in Thousand Year Door, showing the Void about to destroy all worlds. You see Flopside, the Old Town, the Kragnon Town, and yeah, that's it three locations, and you don't really see the people's reactions besides Merlin and Nolrim. This would have a lot more impact if each world was greatly expanded upon, each had towns full of people you actually care about and interact with, have side quests, tie them into the story of the area. It's a good thing that the Samur Kingdom was handled the way it was, because without it, there would hardly be any reason to care. I did just go on about how the worlds aren't interesting enough for me to care about them being destroyed, but I still do care about the threat of the Void, and it's mainly because of the main plot, and especially the Samur Kingdom. In fact, let's talk about the Void. The Void itself, as a concept, is the most terrifying thing about this game. It's this impending doom that you can see almost anywhere, constantly reminding you of what is coming if you fail. The destruction of the Samur Kingdom is probably the most important part of this entire story, because it shows you exactly what you're trying to prevent. In many stories, you have to stop something bad from happening, but you never really get to see what would really happen if you fail. Sure, you get an idea, you're told what will happen, but you don't truly give the threat the respect it deserves unless you see the results of it coming to pass. When the Samur Kingdom is destroyed, you see exactly what will happen if you fail. You barely escape it. But when you go back, there is nothing left but an empty void. Aside from a few remnants scattered around to remind you of what this place once was, there's nothing left. It's empty. And this is what will happen to every other world you've been to, as well as countless others you haven't. This is the single darkest moment in the game, in the series, possibly in the entire Mario franchise. And the more you think about it, the darker it gets. I've heard people point out that after you get sent to the Underwear, you don't see any Samur guys there, meaning that the Void didn't kill them, it erased them from existence, thus they don't even get an afterlife. And yes, that is true and makes the Void even scarier, but there's something else most people seem to have missed. I haven't heard anyone else talk about this, but there are even darker implications to this Void and it's staring you right in the face. I guess I don't blame people for not noticing it since they've been looking at it the entire game. But right here, in the over there, you can still see the Void. This means that the Void will erase it as well as the underwear. It erases the afterlife. Imagine, something so terrifying and destructive that there's literally nowhere you can go to hide from it. It will consume you no matter how far you run from it. The only option you think you have left to escape it is death. But then you discover that even that can't save you. The power of the Void is stronger than death itself. There is no escape. There's no hope. The void consumes all, and when its job is done, there won't be anything left. Theoretically, everyone in Flipside could go to a destroyed dimension to escape the void, but that wouldn't exactly be a good option either. With nothing left anywhere, you wouldn't have much of a life to live. Not to mention with the lack of food and water, you'd eventually die. But then again, if the afterlife is also gone, what would happen if you were to die? Would the result essentially be the same as if the void consumed you anyway? Or would you not even be able to die? Which is worse? 
On one hand, you technically survive and get to live, but you'd be forever wandering an empty white void, nothing to find except a few remnants left over from whatever ruined world you're walking through. Would seeing these remnants help you not go insane by taking your mind off the infinite nothingness and allow you to think of what this place once was? Or would the constant reminder that this used to be a world full of life, full of people, that has now been completely wiped away be worse than if it was just blank? This game really makes you think. Not a whole lot of Mario games can do that to this degree, and that's what makes it so special. But now, I think it's time to talk about the characters. Let's start with the main character of this game, Tippy. Yeah, Tippy, not Mario. Mario was the main character in the previous games, but not this one. The premise of the first game was Mario had to stop Bowser and save Princess Peach. The premise of the Thousand Year Door was Mario sets out to find a legendary treasure and also save Princess Peach in the process and then ends up saving the world from a demon. This game is about a loving couple that gets separated. The man, heartbroken, gives in to his despair and lashes out at the universe, while the woman, who has lost her memory and is slowly regaining it, has to stop the destruction that her lover is causing, until they eventually reunite and sacrifice themselves to undo all the damage that had been done. Sure, Mario is the chosen one, the hero of prophecy to stop the void, but the story isn't about him. It isn't his story, but it is Tippy's story. The Mario characters are thrown into someone else's story abducted from their own world and into something completely different. This also plays into the criticism of this not feeling like a Mario game, but I've already gone over that. Plus, it's not unheard of for the main character of a story to not be the player character, nor is it a bad thing. But anyways, for Tippy herself, she could slightly be compared to the partners of the previous games in that she will be doing the talking for Mario. The main difference is that she will always be out, so you always get her dialogue. And this is in addition to the character you're playing as. If you have Peach, Bowser, or Luigi out, they will also add to the dialogue without removing Tippies. In fact, in more serious moments, even those characters have little input, and it's pretty much all Tippy talking. Anyways, Tippy herself isn't very complex. She's a kind and compassionate person, generally tries to do the right thing. She gets along well with Mario and the others, though some side characters manage to get under her skin. As we find out, she turns out to be Lady Timpany, though this doesn't really change anything about her. She's still the same person, but now is more concerned about Blue Air, obviously. Not much to discuss with her that hasn't been discussed with the main story, though, so let's talk about Mario. Mario is still a plank of wood moving on. Okay, no. I do have some stuff to say about him. Mario, like before, doesn't talk, and again, hardly expresses himself in any way here. And I feel like this is a big missed opportunity in this game in particular. It didn't really matter in the first game because it was light on story and pretty light-hearted, so there wasn't much in the way of really emotional scenes. It wasn't really much of an issue in Thousand Year Door because you had all the partners, but there were still some scenes where having Mario express himself would have been great, like when the Shadow Queen took over Peach's body. But here, you don't have partners. Yes, you do have Peach, Bowser, and Luigi, but unless this scene has all of them, if you're playing as Mario, you're losing a lot of potential dialogue. You always have Tippy to do the talking, but if you have Mario out, it's only her as opposed to any other character where you have Tippy and that other character talking. So you never want to be playing as Mario, so you get more dialogue. But also, there's a lot more emotional scenes in this game, and Mario hardly reacts to them. Mario hasn't talked in more than a few words at a time in so long that it would be weird for him to start having entire conversations, even in text. But you don't need dialogue to make him better express himself. I know this is cheating a bit given these games came out much later, but look at Mario Odyssey and Luigi's Mansion 3. Look at how expressive Mario is. Even without dialogue, you can still get a good idea of what he's thinking or at least how he feels about the situation. Hell, even before that, in Dark Moon he was expressive. Even further back, the Galaxy games. Actually, even before Super Paper Mario came out, Mario Sunshine. Mario has a personality. He has been quite expressive before. And this is the deepest, most emotional story he's been a part of, and he has none of that expressiveness. Imagine if in Castle Black, during the scenes where you're losing the characters one by one, how great it'd be if Mario had the expressiveness of Odyssey in Luigi's Mansion 3. The other characters are able to bring out emotions with the dialogue, but when Luigi is left behind, all we have is Tippy and Mario. In this moment, it's uncertain if any of the others are still alive. In this moment, Mario could have truly lost Bowser, his arch rival who he's been fighting for decades. Peach, the princess he's dedicated his life to protecting, who he is possibly in love with. And Luigi, his brother, the only known family he has. 
all of them gone in a short amount of time, and Mario doesn't react much to it. They do try to give him some kind of reactions. He's reluctant to leave Peach behind, but Luigi conveys that more than Mario. And not to say we don't get a look into his character at all. I mean, after Luigi is lost, he's quick to keep moving forward because he knows time is running out. Plus, he's shown to be confident that they're all still alive. That does inform us of how strong-willed he is, that the potential loss of a family member won't stop him from doing what needs to be done, and that he has faith in the abilities of them to be able to get out of those situations. Just imagine what it could have been like with more expressive animations. How much more emotional weight these scenes could have had to see Mario struggle with his need to save the universe and his desire to not leave Peach and Luigi behind. I know it probably is a bit unreasonable given this game's art style and limited animations, and they already do a fantastic job making an incredibly emotional story in spite of this, but man, think of the potential this story has. There's not a whole lot to talk about with Peach and Bowser. They are pretty similar to how they were in previous games. The big difference is their roles. Peach is no longer captured and giving you information, and Bowser is not the villain, nor is he in the background one step behind you. Both of them are out there with Mario helping out. It's nice to see Peach going out and help Mario, and she's pretty capable. She is still the kind princess she was in the previous games, but here there's a bit of a difference. Even though it wasn't her fault, she's taking responsibility for her part in summoning the Chaos Heart, and going out to fix it instead of waiting for Mario to do it. Now, she didn't just sit around in the previous game, she did actively sneak around and give Mario info on what's going on, but here she isn't restricted and can fully help out. She is also more assertive and doesn't take crap from anyone. I really like this version of Peach. I don't really care for her that much in the main series, but in Paper Mario, she's a lot better. And as for Bowser, well, he already had some of the funniest writing in the previous games, so having him on your team is simply amazing. He's just as great as he was in Thousand Year Door, but with even more opportunities to talk. I love how it takes a lot of convincing to get him to join Mario. He's just like, no, I don't wanna. I'd think about it if it was for you, but there's no way I'm helping Mario. But, but I'm Bowser. I'm grade A, 100% prime cut final boss. I'm gonna take over the world any day now. No way am I helping Mario. He's always trashing my awesome plans. And the thing that convinces him is telling him that he can't take over the world if it's destroyed, and that his minions are now doing Black's evil bidding instead of his. After a while of having Bowser on your side, you start forgetting he's Mario's arch-rival. It just feels natural. They might have gotten along if Bowser didn't like Peach as much as he did. And this was established before, but I love that this game cements that Bowser really cares about Peach. He was excited to marry her, and when everyone gets separated in the underwear, he tries to fight you again because Peach isn't there, and he thinks you're trying to break him and Peach up. Not much else to say, but I think this could possibly be the best these two characters have ever been. At the very least, it's up there. Now let's talk about the most important character in the game, Mr. L. Now you might be wondering, who is this mysterious man? Well, I've got it figured out. He's Lord Crump. I mean, think about it. He's a master of disguise as shown with his Four Eyes persona, and he's an expert in robotics. First, Magnus von Grapple. And now, Brobot. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. All right, it's fun to pretend to not know who Mr. L is, but we've got to talk about this. Luigi is very interesting in this game. He didn't really have any important roles in the previous games. He was more a background joke. But now, he's not just part of the story, but he's one of the most important characters. The Prognosticus even acknowledges this. The stuff they do with Luigi in this game is insane. Mr. L as a concept is amazing. I mean, think about it. Think about Mario and Luigi's relationship. When have they ever been put against each other? They've always had each other's back. There's never really been a conflict between the two of them. Not that I can think of. And no, Smash or Mario Party or any of the sports games don't count. Here, Luigi has been brainwashed and is forced to fight his own brother, and Mario doesn't even know it. He has no idea he's fighting Luigi. This is another instance of showing that Black isn't messing around. Not nearly as much as with the destruction of the Samurai Kingdom, but still, he's the only villain that managed to get Mario and Luigi to fight each other. Well, at least until Dementio did it again. 
I talked about how I wished Mario would be more expressive when he thinks Luigi might have died. But how do you think he might have felt when having to fight Super Dementio? His own brother, taken and fused with the Chaos Heart to make this monstrosity. And in order to save all worlds, Mario must destroy it. The thing that is also his brother. Now Luigi is fine in the end, but there's no way Mario could have known Luigi would have survived this. Man, Luigi has it rough in this game. With the brainwashing and the two separate times the game makes you think he might have just died. But his character is still treated well, and his dialogue is on point. Shag, this mustache is all Luigi. Well that's it for the main cast, but now for the villains. Let's work our way up and start with O-Chunks. O-Chunks is rather interesting, more so than you'd expect from the typical big dumb brute. He is honor bound, you can see how in two of the times you beat him he accepts defeat rather gracefully, well as graceful as O-Chunks can get, even wishing for you to give him an honorable death. He is also extremely loyal to Count Black. He's always the most eager to go out and fight the hero. He's willing to lay down his life for him, even if it means he won't be part of the perfect world he thinks Black will give him. You can see a bit of conflict with the honor-bound part of him, and the loyalty he has for Black. He wanted an honorable death, true because he felt he couldn't show his face to Black after that defeat, but it was still for honor. But the thing that made him change his mind was something that could potentially aid Count Black. And then, when you fight him for the final time, the honor-bound part of him takes over. Even though, again, he wanted an honorable death, he saved the heroes from the trap. This trap would have finished him. He was already prepared to die, and it would have taken care of the heroes, which obviously would have been very beneficial to the Count. But he still lets them pass. It's an interesting conflict, but even with that, he's still very loyal. Although the circumstances for that loyalty are rather cruel. Talking to Carson, he talks about O'Chunks and how he was once a general of an army 1,000 strong, but he was sold out by one of his own and lost his whole army. Apparently, Black played upon his shame and depression to enlist him. That's all the info we get on why he's loyal to Black. He is the only one like this, and as cruel as Black was to do this, it does explain the loyalty, since it was a disloyal soldier that put him in that position. And also, because of that, it would be easy for him to agree with the idea of destroying all these worlds full of war and betrayal, and replacing them with perfect ones. I wonder, you think maybe O-Chunks would still be loyal to Black if he knew what his plan really was? Or do you think he would hate him? Because I don't think he'd take another betrayal very well. Mimi is probably the least complex of these characters. Her personality can mostly be summed up with her introduction when Dementio reads her diary. Spoiled brat and also girl. She likes to set traps and use her shape-shifting to fool you into falling for those traps. Apparently her true form is some spider monstrosity and the way she turns into it is by snapping her neck. But like O-Chunks, she is very loyal to Black. He is about the only character she respects and seems to have a bit of a crush on. We don't have any idea of how she met Black or why she's so loyal. Talking to Carson doesn't really reveal anything like that, although we do learn that she could be a failed pixel experiment or the unintended creation of a witch who was researching a shape-shifting potion. It's interesting info to have, but it's not all that relevant to this story. Nastasia, though, she's one of the most interesting characters. She's the most loyal and the closest to the Count. To the point she's obviously in love with him. To the point she knows his true intentions and yet is still going along with him. She knows he won't create perfect new worlds. She knows helping him will lead to her being consumed by the Void. She isn't exactly happy about this, but it's something she is willing to endure. The sad part is she knows about Timpani. She's in love with Black, but knows he doesn't love her back and knows that it's because he loved Timpani that he's even doing all this. Black even says to her face, she can never be replaced. You can never hope to do so. The game has a happy end. Most characters have a happy, or at least bittersweet end. Nastasia almost has a bittersweet end, but not quite. After Blumiere and Timpani sacrifice themselves, and Merlin is unsure of what could have happened to them, Nastasia says she believes that they are alive and happy together. This is the only time you see her smile. She tries to say more, but is unable to contain herself and just starts crying because she's now alone. This is the first time we see her like this. She rarely expresses her feelings, and the few times it does happen were more accidental slips. 
Now, Ochunks and Mimi do comfort her, and it does seem like she might be fine after all. But talking to her after beating the game, it still seems she's having a hard time accepting it. And this line in particular about how she understands what it was like when Blue Mirror turned into Count Black is a bit worrying, especially how she follows up that line. She's starting to feel like Count Black herself. And then she says, I wonder if this is how I'll spend the remainder of my days. It's pretty clear she's not doing very well. Blue Mirror did what he did because he lost the one he loved, and Nastasia just lost the one she loved. The last thing of note with Nastasia is some lore from Carson, especially of bats and men. It doesn't specify who's it about, but it's obviously about how Black first met Nastasia. A man was looking for a girl he lost, obviously Black, but then found a bat in a trap who he then set free. Later it came back and transformed into a woman of the same species as him, and pledged her eternal loyalty to him. Now it is pretty obvious that this is Nastasia. She does look like she could be the same species as Black, though there are still some red Radical differences, though we might be able to chalk that up to females looking very different from males, or Blue Mirror's transformation into Black was a little bit more literal than expected. Either way, the only other character it could be is Mimi, but everything about this story points to Nastasia, except the shape-shifting part. It is odd that we have a bat transform into a woman when it isn't about Mimi. Maybe the story isn't literal, but it's just a bit weird. And now for Count Black. He is such a good villain. One of my favorites, in fact, and easily the best in the series. He has such a strong introduction, and while he may seem simple at the start, as the game goes on and more details about him are revealed, he becomes so interesting. Despite his sympathetic nature, he still has quite a threatening presence. When he arrives in person in the Samur Kingdom, it's a real oh crap moment. Interesting thing about him that supports his minions being so loyal to him, he generally seems like a really good guy. At least when you ignore the whole destroying all worlds thing. He's never cruel to his minions, even offering Nastasia to leave in good graces if she feels like she isn't up to it. In fact, in fact, Nastasia is the one who disciplines the other minions if they were to fail or disobey orders. Although we only see it happen to Ochunks, and it isn't any kind of physical punishment. He had to write a report on his own incompetence and then sing a song about Black 1000 times. But Black seems to be pretty forgiving of them, although the bit of lore about why Ochunks is loyal is still rather questionable. We actually know quite a lot about Black, since a good chunk of his story is dedicated to him, obviously, and we really come to understand his motives. Obviously, his actions are not justified, but he is still sympathetic. Some may say it was a serious overreaction to want to destroy all of existence in response to losing his girlfriend, but that's the point. He's in the wrong. That's how villains work. Going into his backstory, Blumier is of the Tribe of Darkness. Now, as we learn from Carson, the Tribe of Darkness used to be a group within the Ancients who had more magic power. This power was very important to the Ancients, and because they feared this power becoming diluted, they forbade marriage outside of their group. This explains why Blumier's father was so angry that he was with a human, and why he did what he did to Timpani. The Tribe of Darkness also stole the Dark Prognosticus for unknown reasons, which explains why they had it. Now imagine you are Blumier. You're told that your kind and humans should never mix. Now mentioning the Tribe of Darkness had become forbidden in other groups, likely because they stole the Dark Prognosticus, and Blumier is confused why Timpani isn't repulsed by his presence. Which tells me he was told that outsiders would hate him because of what he is. Now one day he meets Timpani, who not only knows what he is and isn't afraid of him, but is also kind to him and helps him when he gets injured. He then falls in love with her and his whole world shifts. But then she's taken away by his own family, which completely devastates him to the point that nothing held any meaning or joy to him. Add on to that this dark book of prophecies that happens to be in the possession of your clan, and you can understand how this happened. The overreaction on his end could be explained once he gets the Dark Prognosticus. It seems he might not have had the idea to destroy all worlds until he read it. I mean, him getting the book is when he became Count Black. Notice how throughout the game, Black constantly talks in the third person, constantly saying his own name. This pleases Count Black. Or he'll end a sentence with, says Count Black. Even the way he laughs has his name in it. Bleh <laughs> Black. Almost like he's constantly reminding himself that he is now Count Black and no longer Lord Blumier. 
Another interpretation is that he's actually quoting the Dark Prognosticus. If it were written in a book, it would have to specify who says what. He also only starts doing it after getting the Dark Prognosticus, and he stops after Dementio gains control of the Chaos Heart. Once he is no longer the one to carry out the prophecy, he stops being Count Black. After Dementio sends him to Dimension D, not once does he say Black again. You can also see Blue Air struggling against the Black identity at a few points, but it isn't until the end when he is finally free from it and is fully Blue Air again. And then there's Dementio. I'm still unsure if he or Count Black is the true main villain of the game. This isn't a Darth Vader and the Emperor kind of thing, since Count Black is the one behind everything, while Dementio was doing his own thing in the background, looking for the right opportunity to take over. Either way, Dementio is also a great villain. You think he's just another minion of Lex, but he does seem pretty suspicious at various points. You're never really sure what he's up to, if he really is loyal to the Count. And his surprise final boss is just incredible. While he isn't close to being as deep as Count Black, he's still a one-of-a-kind villain for Mario, and he's done a lot that no other has done. Looking at his lore is pretty interesting. He was the only one who approached Black and tried to join him rather than Black finding him. Black even rejected him at first, but later came back when he read about someone similar in the Dark Prognosticus. Also, in the lore about the Pixels, we learn that they were first created by a powerful magician that was among the Ancients and that he used the Dark Prognosticus to do it, which led to the Pixel Uprising. This magician had a wife, son, and a daughter. The wife and son died in an accident, and the daughter died of an illness, and sometime later the magician himself died. However, it's rumored that the son managed to survive, which implies that he might be Dementio or at least an ancestor. Could explain how he knows so much about the prophecy, he may have read it in the Dark Prognosticus while his father had it. Though that only works if he is the son, since one of the Master Magician's apprentices took the Dark Prognosticus and disappeared so nothing like the Pixel Uprising could happen again. Regardless, his origin and how he knows so much is up for interpretation. Just like the previous games, there are plenty of side characters, but I won't be saying much about them as there is much more emphasis on the main plot and characters rather than with the side characters. Sometimes you get a character that is important to the chapter, but most of the side characters are there for flavor, and there's less to them than the ones in the previous game. This game is sort of opposite to Thousand Year Door when it comes to the characters. Super comes out on top with its major characters and villains. On the hero side, Peach, Bowser, and Luigi are the best they've ever been. And on the villain side, well let's just say Grotus, Lord Crump, Beldum, and the Shadow Queen don't come close to Count Black, Dementio, Nastasia, Mimi, and O'Chunks. But when it comes to the side characters, Thousand Year Door has more of an edge. A Thousand Year Door has so many good side characters, and in most cases, Super's equivalent to those characters aren't quite as good. Comparing Professor Frankly to Merlin, Frankly has a much more entertaining personality. Merlin isn't bad by any means, but he's a bit boring by comparison. Flint Cragley is essentially this game's Flavio, and while he is entertaining in his own right, I still find Flavio to be the one on top. Now, Super does have some good side characters. I'd say Watch It is the best of the old mayor characters, even if he has less screen time. But here's the issue. Because of the way the game is structured, there are much less towns which means there are much less side characters. Thousand Year Door had a lot of side characters like the Puny Elder, King K, Bandy Andy, Jolene, Papatch, Frankie, Francesca, Don Pianta, Pennington, the Rich Babam family, and the businessmen. Super loses the Thousand Year Door in the quantity of side characters. Now you could say quality over quantity, but Thousand Year Door also had quality with those characters. Super side characters do fare pretty well when they are more so tied into the story of the chapter, since you get more time with them. I've already talked about Love Bee, but there's also Squirps, who shares a similar role. He's with you throughout the entirety of Chapter 4, and he has a way of annoying Tippy, just like Love Bee. The game sort of tries to make you think he might be one of Black's minions, since in the interlude right before, he says he's sending someone we've never seen before. But that turns out to be Mr. L. And Squirps turns out to be a prince who was put in a hibernation capsule 1,500 years ago by his own mother, so when the hero came, he could lead him to 
the pure heart and save the world. While it's not nearly as gut-punching as Love Me, it's still rather emotional, and shows even one-off side characters have a lot to them. So it's not like Super doesn't stand a chance in this regard. But there is one area where Thousand Year Door dominates. The partners. Super doesn't have partners. The closest thing to them are the Pixels, and they do not even begin to come close to being as good as the partners. The Pixels do each have their own personalities, and some are pretty funny, but the issue is they only talk once. After you first get them, they never say anything else for the rest of the game. The partners in Thousand Year Door all have distinctive personalities. They talk a lot more often, and they are fleshed out characters with their own arcs, and have much more significance to the story. Now when it comes to the minor villains, it's a little harder to say which is superior. They both have great minor villains, and each one have ones better than the other. Hooktail and Fractail are pretty similar, but I'd give the edge to Fractail because of his glitched up freakout when Dementio zaps him. Cortez is more entertaining and interesting than Bone Chill, not to mention he helps you out in the end. But Bone Chill is more intimidating and has a bigger overall impact in the story with revealing that Love Bee is a pure heart. Francis is super entertaining. He's like one of the funniest characters across the series. I mean, look at this guy. He's one big nerd stereotype who's obsessed with video games, anime, comics, and pretty much everything geeky. And you get an extensive look at this throughout his castle when having to answer questions to get into different areas. They knew what they were doing when they wrote this. But despite all this, Dupless is also pretty entertaining, while also being a much bigger threat while delivering one of the best twists in one of the best sub-stories. King Crocus is interesting as a misunderstood villain. You think he's evil, but it's because the polluted water was driving him crazy. But Grubba is probably the best minor villain, with his seriously twisted goal of sucking the life out of people to keep himself strong. Not to mention, he's an amazing twist villain. Although Smorg isn't going to beat anyone from Super. It's a really tough call between these two, because they both have great minor villains. I used to think Thousand Year Door was easily better in this regard, but after thinking about it more, it is isn't clear cut which has the overall stronger lineup. I think I'd still say Thousand Year Door has a slight edge just because of Grubba and Dupless, who are the best two overall. Characters like Francis are super entertaining, but Grubba and Dupless have much better stories attached to them. But when it comes to comparing the story as a whole, while both have advantages over the other, the advantages Super has over Thousand Year Door are much more substantial. Because it is the main plot and the main characters and villains. As much as I love the story in Thousand Year Door, as much as I love those characters, Super has it beat. It isn't uncommon to hear people say Super has the best story in the series, but it really does. Sure, in some areas, Thousand Year Door is better, the side characters in the world, but the part that counts the most, the story of Lord Blumiere and Lady Timpany, is just beautiful. The writing in this game is spot on, the characters are deeper, the stakes are the highest they could possibly be, and the game is so much more emotional. Not that Thousand Year Door lacked emotion, not at all, but as I went over with Chapter 7, most of it ended with a more happy feeling. Super Paper Mario isn't afraid to leave you sad, and unlike Thousand Year Door, it isn't afraid of killing off characters, at least for the most part. Dementio is definitively dead, and while they say Blue Mare and Timpani are alive together, they are very much gone from this world, never to be seen again. Now there are a couple instances of damage not being permanent. The Samur Kingdom is revived, but I'm fine with that since it was destroyed by the Void, which is this unnatural force that doesn't go by the same rules as everything else. So I think having the damage it caused to be reversed is pretty reasonable. Now the more questionable one is Love Bee. She sacrifices herself in this really gut-punching scene, but if you go back at the end you see she came back with no explanation. I guess the pure heart could have done that. I've heard some people say Jadies brought her back, but her dialogue deconfirms that theory. She was down in the underwear when Granby called her to tell her Love Bee suddenly came back. I'm still unsure how to feel about this. It does kind of take a bit away from her sacrifice, but I don't think it takes enough away to ruin it. And it is genuinely nice to see them get a happy end after how much they hurt from it. I completely understand if anyone doesn't like this, but I think it is less of an issue than the couple of issues in Thousand Year Doors ending. The main point is, this story is fantastic. In fact, it's one of my favorite stories in any game, or any media, really, if it wasn't evident in how long I spent talking about it. 
I haven't really seen anyone really dive deep into this game's story. People generally agree on the story being very good, but not much in the way of analysis. Even though there is so much to talk about as I demonstrated, which is why I don't apologize for how long I spent on it. In general, the Paper Mario series has been rather lacking in analysis, which is one reason I'm even doing this marathon. But we're not done yet. Believe it or not, this is in fact not a book, so I think it's time we start talking about the other aspects. This isn't just a story analysis. Hey, this review turned out to be way longer than expected, and took way longer to make than expected, so I've decided to split it into two parts. This was just the first half. In part two, I'll go over everything else, and that hopefully shouldn't take too long to make. And with that, I want to thank my patrons, IKG Productions, The SideQuest Gamer, and Tanuki. If you enjoyed my content, please consider supporting me, and I'll see you in the next part.